Welcome to SBME Interfaces. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to the people that interface with biomedical engineering from students and faculty to staff and industry and everyone in between. BME is a broad field that encompasses so many different perspectives, journeys, skill sets, and backgrounds, and we are excited to share them all with you. So today we're very excited to be interfacing with Anna Blakeney and Nika Shakiba. Nika is an assistant professor in SBME, um, multi-award winner. She was an answer postdoctoral fellow. Uh, she comes to her postdoctoral fellowship at MIT. And before that, she did her PhD in stem cell bioengineering uh, at UFD. And she's also a biomedical engineer in training as an undergrad, again, at UFD. Her research program applies a combined uh, systems and synthetic biology approach to reverse and forward engineering the role of cell competition development and stem cell systems. Uh, she's also a big believer in outreach and mentorship and beyond her research and uh, teaching uh, duties, she's really passionate about providing equity and mentorship and advice uh, access through her latest project, Advice to a Scientist, which we'll learn more about today. Anna is also an assistant professor, uh, home based in Michael Smith Laboratories, but also a part of the School of Biomedical Engineering. She too is a multi-award winner. So we have a couple of heavy hitters with us. Uh, she did her undergrad in uh, chemical and biological engineering, and then uh, pursued a PhD in bioengineering at the University of Washington, followed by postdoctoral training at Imperial College London. Her group will uh, focus on molecular for, uh, formulation of immune engineering to develop the next gen of RNA vaccines and therapies, a very timely area of research. And she's also passionate about uh, pu public engagement, is part of Team Halo, a group of scientists and clinicians who educate the public about vaccines using TikTok. So welcome both. Thanks for having us. All right, so uh, I wanted to start. Uh, you both joined us in at a very interesting time. Uh, you both had to you know, move cities, um, start shift labs, um, all through a pandemic. Uh, so what were some of the biggest challenges and biggest surprises for you over these last uh, 12 months? We'll start with you, Anna. Yeah, sure. So I think I actually uh, moved at a time when it was a little bit easier than Nika because everybody had kind of already gotten used to the pandemic. So I just started in January. And I think by then there were actually systems in place for everybody to, you know, you could be back in the lab and yeah, it's definitely a very different feeling. And I wouldn't recommend uh, moving internationally during a global pandemic, but <laughs> it's actually all turned out fine. So yeah, there were some, you know, minor hiccups when I was actually traveling here, like Canada canceled all flights from the UK three days before I was supposed to fly here. So I had to get a little creative in my transport and ended up taking like three flights through the US and it was a whole thing, but it's actually, it's actually been fine. And I think, you know, starting now, I've really been able to hit the ground running um, as opposed to kind of the, the depths of the pandemic last year. What about you, Nika? Yeah, I guess um, I moved earlier on in the pandemic. So I moved in July of last year uh, to Vancouver. And prior to that, I had kind of made a stint across the border, moving back from Boston to Toronto, which was my home base, um, and then moving from Toronto to Vancouver. So there was definitely challenges with that. Um, and it was, it was kind of interesting to wake up every day and see what the kind of the new hurdle may be. Um, and then setting up a lab, <laughs> I don't know if Anna's experienced this, but you know, all of a sudden the same reagents and equipment that we need in our experimental labs are needed on the front lines of COVID. Uh, and it becomes um, you know, more challenging to start up those types of uh, wet lab work. So that was another kind of fun hurdle that we've since overcome. And uh, it's been great to kind of reorient and, and meet new people in this very welcoming environment of SBME. That's definitely made it a lot easier. I've also made friends with the trees and the forest behind me really well. <laughs> and a few friendly people like Anna who've been really, really kind to keep me occupied in this transition. Yeah, we go on some walks in the forest. <laughs> yep. That's, that's great. I think that's been one of the silver linings of this. We're forced to interact more in person rather than email and phone. So taking a little bit step back and we'll start with you, Nika, what sparked your interest in engineering and then sort of going to the BME field and now you're here? 
Yeah, you know, I, I've had a lot of time now in this silence, I guess, at home to reflect <laughs> on my journey and kind of what brought me to biomedical engineering and to really become aware of the inequities in that pipeline. Um, and I think personally, much of it was influenced by my parents, my, you know, my support system, my environment, mentors along the way that empowered me and advocated for me. And I think they helped bring out that sort of innate curiosity inside me, which was to try to understand the rules that govern the world around us and then manipulate them for greater good. That's really what an engineer does. Um, so I think that was my ultimate motivation for going into engineering. And it, it was only possible because of the supports around me to do that. That's great. And you, Anna? Yeah, so very similar. I think it's hard to pinpoint like what inspired me to go into engineering, but I think it was a culmination of actually having a lot of really good science and math teachers and mentors early on who I think really empowered me to feel like I could do it. I think just for a long time, I really lacked self-confidence and being like, oh, like I am really good at math or I am good at science. And so it took teachers who really cared about me to kind of give me that confidence for sure. But, you know, going back to inequities and opportunities, I definitely was very privileged to have opportunities while I was young to even understand what engineering was and what that means. I think that's a mystery for a lot of young people. So I went to, uh, for example, I went to an engineering camp when I was a uh, junior in high school. And so I got to see, you know, oh, this is what research actually is. And this is, you know, what it's like to do an undergrad degree in engineering. And so I had a little bit of insight into what that actually was. And I think that, you know, for people who don't have that or, you know, don't know an engineer or a scientist, I think that is one of the main barriers. Like you don't even know what these people do or what it takes. And so it's a total mystery. That's great. Yeah. On that note, um, if, if, I'd really like to get both your perspective on this too, is, is how do you feel we can bring more women and more diversity in general uh, to science? Um, what do you feel works? What do you feel doesn't work? Do you have any ideas that we can put forward? I mean, I have ideas, which I've, I've kind of wrapped up into the Advice to a Scientist initiative, but I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking back to my own experience. And as Anna said, with mentorship being such an important ingredient um, to create the right kind of circumstances to bring you know, minorities and, and groups that we don't typically see in STEM to STEM. Um, and so I'm trying to emulate that, you know, I try to pass on that like quality, personalized advice sharing and mentorship to others that may not have that as easily accessible. Um, like Anna, I was privileged. Both my parents were engineers. I knew what engineering was about. Not necessarily biomedical engineering. That's kind of been an ongoing journey. Um, but I've kind of, I was primed to, to look look at engineering as a career. And so I think one of the key approaches is mentorship and, and promoting visibility um, of women and, and other gender minorities. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think another thing that works really well and is important to consider is this idea of like a pipeline into a program. So I think you really have to target people like years before they're even thinking about or applying to college. So one experience that I've had that really informs this is I used to volunteer at this tutoring center while I was in graduate school and it was all for um, really minority students who were primarily women around the Seattle area who were all going to be first time college attendees. And mm -hmm. So I would just tutor them in math and science usually once a week. And, you know, they had just a really great program to support them and provide them with just that insight of how that even works, kind of like going back to understanding what engineering is. But that just enlightened me as to kind of how much I took that for granted growing up, like, you know, having the support for applying for standardized testing or, um, you know, writing essays, even knowing what classes to take, having access to, to in the states, like classes that would give you college credit and just all those things that you do to get ahead. And when you have a parent or when your parents have never been to college, you just don't have that 
environment necessarily. And so I think there's a number of things that, you know, undergraduate programs can do as well as graduate programs, honestly, like there, I think there's mysteries that surround both. Um, but it's really kind of targeting those high school students who just may not have that access and saying, look, here's what BME is, and here's what you need to do to get into a program like this. And the problem is like that starts many years before they would even be applying. Yeah, if I could just add on to that. I mean, I think the other thing that was really effective for me was just like sparking that excitement for science, for asking those questions and then tinkering, right? And so fostering those types of experiences for younger people, even before high school, I think can be hugely impactful. And there's a number of initiatives like Let's Talk Science that kind of do that. And I think we should all invest our time and energy in if we can. Yeah. There's a mindset there's a mindset shift there too, right? Where you say tinkering and there's so many people in older generations who don't think you should tinker. You know, you should just choose and go here, but like, no, tinker, try different things and, and get interested, be curious, right? Absolutely, yeah. make an informed decision about your future, right? And so yeah. that requires yeah. exposure to things. Yeah. And I, I think it's also kind of a rebranding of engineering to this like very archaic stereotype of like, you're just, doing equations and like math and, you know, I don't know. I think like, even when I hear the word engineer, I, I, there's like this image in my head of what that means. And even though my experience is so different than that, like I know how fun and how creative you can be and just how exciting it is, but I don't think that's like the brand of engineering that it currently has in society. Yeah. So Anna, you're saying you don't miss differential equations and triple integrals? Come on. <laughs> I mean, I do them for fun sometimes, like when I'm trying to have a really good time, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> we, should, we should meet up for a forest walk and do yeah, some yeah. integrals. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh my God, that sounds like a dream. But uh, I, uh, the, I mean, you hit it on both of you on the head is access and opportunities and information, but also we need to be, do better. The faces of engineering are changing and it's diverse and we... That's mm -hmm. one goal we have in the school, and for sure, I'm sure both of you will be involved in that. So, uh, and we'll get back to advice to scientists and, and all the outreach both of you do. But I'm just curious, Anna, uh, what drew you to uh, coming to UBC and uh, being part of uh, the Michael Smith Labs and the School of BME? Yeah, so um, I originally, so I did my PhD in Seattle. So I kind of knew the area and I really like just like this kind of West Coast feel. Um, and so, you know, when I was applying for positions, I saw that there was an opening and I actually applied through the Michael Smith labs and then have this joint appointment with, with BME. But what I was really excited about, about both of them is that so for Michael Smith Labs, it's kind of this inter interdisciplinary department where people come from all different backgrounds, but the focus is really on biotechnology and translating research um, to the clinic, which is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and they also have a, another mandate kind of within MSL about outreach, which I'm also very passionate about. So those were kind of two great fits for me there. And then for SBME, I think what's really exciting is that um, for a lot of BME programs in North America as a whole, you know, they have more of a basis in engineering as opposed to a true basis in like biology and medicine. And so I think what SBME at UBC is really, you know, does that's really exciting is really combines like this basis in biology and engineering and you know, they have all these relationships with the faculty of medicine. And so I think that also makes then those interactions and collaborations um, a lot more easy <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was really like, yeah, just being able to be a part of two really exciting departments and living in this beautiful place. I mean, I'm super grateful to be here. That's great. And what about you, Nico? What drew you to UBC and SVME? Well, I'm not a native West Coaster, so I honestly can't say that, you know, I heard the call of the mountains and the trees, <laughs> but I now really appreciate it. I wish I heard that call earlier, <laughs> but I, I was really committed to come back to Canada. So as you mentioned, I went off to Boston to do my postdoc, but I was really, I set my sights on coming back to Canada and um, not allowing the brain drain to, you know, catch me. Um, so, so UBC emerges a really exciting opportunity in particular because they were 
really self-reflecting on what biomedical engineering means and then pushing the boundaries of that definition and then you know revamping the school and the strategic plan that really emphasized research and teaching innovation was really kind of timely and exciting for me and I wanted to contribute to that um, but I also really appreciated as Anna said the sort of basing engineering into a foundation of biology and kind of reminding us that we don't have to engineer around biology. We've been doing that for years and we do it great, right? So, you know, lots of people develop devices that interface with the body or with cells. And that's certainly been the vision of kind of biomedical engineering. But now we can also think about engineering cells and tissues and organs themselves. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the branding um, of biomedical engineering that I wanted to contribute to and really challenge or blur the boundaries of what engineering means. Miguel, new tagline. We don't engineer like, around seriously. biology. We engineer <laughs> biology. I love no, it. You know, I love that. This is, my, my brain starts spinning right now. Like, this is fantastic. We're going to go deeper on this. Um, <laughs> on that note, I mean, you are, you're sort of on the ground level of this new evolution of, uh, of biomedical engineering, especially uh, on, on the West Coast. How do you see that evolving? Or more importantly, how do you hope it evolves? We'll start with you, Anna. Yeah, so I mean, working in the field of RNA vaccines right now, I could not have planned a more <laughs> strategic time to start my independent lab. So that's really exciting. But um, in general, I think Vancouver and the biotech scene here is super, super exciting, um, in addition to all of the innovations that are happening at UBC. So I think something that a lot of people don't realize is that actually, like all of these RNA vaccines that are currently approved were really enabled by innovations that came out of UBC. Um, so like Peter Colas's lab and um, companies that have spun out of there. And so uh, something that I think is really exciting, but also a huge challenge is that, you know, Canada didn't have its, or like doesn't have its own homemade COVID vaccine, right? Which is crazy, despite that technology and knowledge originating from here. And so um, during my postdoc I, at Imperial College, I worked on an RNA vaccine and doing all the preclinical studies and getting that into clinical trials. And so that was a really valuable experience that, you know, now I'm intending to continue here um, and thinking about, you know, how do we prepare for the next pandemic? How do we make better vaccines for lots of different diseases we already have? Um, and being able to do that in kind of an epicenter of like bleeding RNA vaccine people is just a really incredible opportunity. And Nico, what about you? Yeah, I guess building on Anna's excitement of Canadian research, um, my, my lab is really found, founded in the concept of stem cells and how powerful they are. Um, and so for those who may not be familiar, stem cells are these magical cells that have the ability to produce specialized cells in the body. All the specialized cells can be produced from pluripotent stem cells in particular. And so you know, they're a really powerful substrate for regenerative medicine, for producing cells and tissues on demand, for transplanting, for drug screening. Um, and the first stem cells were discovered in 1961 in Toronto, actually. Um, so that is our legacy as Canadians. And I've been really kind of excited to help build that here at UBC. And I think Vancouver in particular is a, is a great place to be for that sort of thing because it's really becoming a sort of hub, the biggest biotech hub in Canada. Um, and hopefully we can kind of join forces with some of the, uh, the US hubs around us um, and really kind of build that expertise. But so, so my lab is really excited about understanding how these cells work when they get along their social lives when they decide to bully each other, which they do. It's not, it's not very Canadian of them, um, but they do. So we wanna understand that kind of bullying behavior, the cooperative behaviors between them, and then to engineer that for better cell therapies. For sure. Uh, there, there are a lot of bullies in Canada. <laughs> to move, move away from that notion. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you both echo interesting. We, we, we have so many great technologies and discoveries coming out of Canada and suddenly it goes south of the border or, or yeah. other countries for manufacturing or other, and it's kind of a, a sad state. So hopefully this pandemic will enlighten the government and others that we need that kind of, and it's interesting you say, Nika, there's a very cool lineage of from uh, Ernest and McCulloch to Connie Eves and Alan Eves and then trickling down. And now you're part of that lineage. So that's a pretty cool thing that we have here. And uh, 
So hopefully we'll get there with all you young and ingenious and intelligent BME <laughs> hires that we have. Um, so start off with Nika, some challenges you face as a new PI, things that open your eyes you weren't expecting and you just want to bang your head against the wall sometimes. <laughs> as honest as you want to be. Well, I guess it's been largely shaped by the environment that the pandemic has imposed on us. And, and one of the challenges that makes me want to bang my head against the wall sometimes <laughs> is that I don't want that kind of spark of excitement that I see in my trainees to die out because they're experiencing this like scientific isolation. So much of biomedical engineering is interdisciplinary and relies on these collaborative interactions with people. And like I myself have projects that are born out of conversations with someone in an elevator or on a subway platform. And all of those opportunities for serendipity are somewhat removed in the pandemic. And I don't want my trainees to miss out on that. So that's been a big sort of bummer in this yeah. pandemic situation. But we're trying to kind of foster as much of that as we can via Zoom. So we do a lot of these types of Zoom meetings with potential collaborators and really get the juices flowing for my trainees to kind of ideate and, and remain excited. Yeah, mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, I think for me, so my lab is just starting up, right? So I have students starting in May and September, but for me, it's for now, it's still kind of just me. And so I'm still in what I refer to as the paperwork phase where <laughs> I'm doing all the paperwork of, you know, writing protocols, ordering things, like doing all the financial aspects of this. Um, to get my lab off the ground, which I will say is uh, definitely the more boring phase of everything. Like, I think we, when you have, or like, you know, when I got this job, I had this vision of like, oh, you know, you get there, it, you're going to have people in your lab, like your own group meeting, you're going to be in the lab doing science. And it's like, there's a long lead time to that actually happening. And so <laughs> now it's like, I'm starting to get to the end of all of the paperwork I have to do, but um, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's kind of like not the most exciting phase of science to be in. Um, but yeah, that will change soon. It's, and, you know, it's, it's an investment in the future. Have you it, found the, the team, sorry, sorry, Pam, have you guys found the team, uh, the team building process more difficult over, over Zoom? Like, um, I know you're not really there yet, Anna, but uh, the, 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 even the prospect of trying to build a team from afar, um, like what kind of challenges that presented? I guess yeah. like, yeah, ahead, I you go, you go. yeah, I can go first, I guess. Um, part of it has been that I just have to like reflect more on what is it that I want in my team members and then how do I assess that on this two-dimensional screen? And, and so much of like our, our social interactions like the cells in us are dependent on these like 3D, you know, the 3D world, being able to read someone's body language and, and being able to like feel their excitement when they talk about something. It's hard to capture that via email and Zoom. Um, but it, the, the, the positive that's come out of it is that I've really had to think more carefully about what are the kind of key ingredients that we can try to look for in our team members to try to round out the team so that we, you know, synergize our expertise well. Mm -hmm. Do you are, I think one thing, I've noticed, and uh, Miguel also, I think, is on the same boat, is as new PIs, you're rarely trained to be leaders. And to me, there's a humongous difference between a leader and a manager, and your leaders, your mentors. Mm -hmm. Does that scare you? What, what have you looked to? Do you look to your own mentors, other people? Because that really can make or break the lab of how do you manage these trainees who spend more time with you than their personal life for <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven years. So, Anna, yeah. you first. Sure. Yeah, I actually, I think we, Nika and I have actually talked about this before, but we both recently did a course too on like supervising graduate students. And so I think it's starting to change now where people have an appreciation that new PIs are not trained in this. And so obviously taking one course doesn't immediately change that, but I think it's good to get some sort of basis of like 
here's all the things you need to think about when you're not just managing, but, you know, mentoring all of these students. But for me, I guess, you know, having worked in a number of different labs now, that's been, uh, you know, firsthand experience of mentoring styles and lab <laughs> dynamics that work and yeah. don't work. And so, you know, I have this idea of what I would like my lab to be like um, based on the experiences I've had. Um, and so it's really just kind of thinking about the, the tools and strategies to be able to implement that. And, you know, as you said, it's, it's really hard to do that over Zoom and, you know, virtual meetings and stuff like that. Um, but it is something I think about intentionally and, you know, making sure people are onboarded really well and, and feel like they're at home and very welcome in the lab. Um, so that's kind of some of the, the first things. <laughs> yeah. Nico, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Anna. Much of it has been, you know, trying to emulate what I liked about my mentorship experiences in my, in my doctoral and postdoctoral life. Um, and I think it's not, it's no coincidence that academic lineages are super influential in, in terms of shaping you as a leader and a mentor, we, we know that, you know, Nobel laureates breed Nobel laureates. We know that strong scientific mentors breed that quality of mentorship. And so I'm just trying to emulate that for my <laughs> students as best I can. That's great. I like that. Um, okay, so on to, on to other things. Uh, Nika, tell us about advice to a scientist. What do you hope to accomplish with it and how's it going? Yeah, I guess, so Advice to a Scientist really aims to democratize science by promoting open access and equitable um, advice sharing. And we wanna basically create these lines of communication between peers at different stages of their careers, whether they're high school student or undergrad, grad, or so on and so forth, and have these kind of experiences and advice share in multiple directions. Um, and it was really born out of a collaboration with my postdoctoral supervisor, Dr. Ron Weiss. And Ron was kind of hoarding articles and resources that he was finding online that he thought would be useful for us as his mentees. And one day he just like unleashed this Dropbox, Dropbox folder on us um, with all of these articles in it. And I was rummaging through and I basically replied to him saying like, this is great, but I can't find anything. <laughs> it's really like, it's a lot. So um, we decided that we would do that rummaging and organization and try to become like the first stop for anyone looking for resources on whatever their issue is in, in the STEM pipeline. So, you know, I don't know how to prepare a poster for a conference presentation, like wh where, where do I go? Where do I find advice? And scientists uh, are so um, innately, in, like we're, we're sort of prepared to be that type of mentor. We want to engage in that type of advice sharing. And that's how we've all kind of grown up as scientists. So we're just kind of building on that um, and collecting all the advice that has amounted over the years of scientists, you know, throwing, throwing out their resources and thoughts into cyberspace and just centralizing it, right? Making it more, more equitable. And then um, since that initial uh, inception, we now have this wonderful team that is composed of Dr. Jennifer Ma, who's a, who's a science artist extraordinaire, and um, another kind of student, Imran Nuradin, who's a grad student in Paris, and he's become our developer. He's helping us build some Twitter networking where we're trying to make this advice sharing more dynamic. And our webmaster, Kia Shakiba, who's my, who's my brother, and he's more voluntold than volunteered for this initiative. <laughs> right. And it's been a fun process. That's great. Um... Anna, you, you're doing a lot of science outreach. TikTok seems to be one of your main platforms. Tell us, how did you get started and and uh, how's it going thus far? Yeah, I think my TikTok reputation precedes me everywhere I go now. Like every meeting I have with a student or prospective collaborator, it's the first thing they mention. So, which is a really funny occurrence. Um, but yeah, I actually, so it wasn't an original idea. So I actually got recruited to this organization called Team Halo. Um, so I was involved in a lot of outreach stuff last year at Imperial around COVID-19 vaccines, um, just because I think, you know, universally, we realized that there was just this gap between what people understood about vaccines and how we make them and um, 
that was creating a lot of vaccine hesitancy in the population that had been brewing actually really for like a decade now. And so I had actually done a Reddit AMA. Um, so I don't know if you guys know what that is, but Reddit is like another social media platform, right? And so they have this section specifically for AMAs, which stands for ask me anything. So they have experts from all different fields and you kind of just type in your questions and then um, have kind of like a very honest dialogue back and forth. And so that um, kind of blew up and it got to the front page of Reddit and someone from team Halo saw it and actually called me the next day on my office phone and at Imperial, I didn't even know my office phone number. So I was always like really sketched <laughs> out when people called me on that. So I was like, mm, not sure who this is. Um, and they were like, yeah, so we're looking to start this um, team of scientists and clinicians who are working on COVID-19 and, you know, we're trying to promote trust in vaccines um, and we're going to do this over TikTok. And I was like, oh, well, you had me until the TikTok part. <laughs> um, I was, yeah, I was very skeptical at first because, yeah, I had never been on it before. And I was like, isn't this something that like 12 year olds are doing because of the pandemic? Like, I didn't really understand it. And so, yeah, it was definitely a learning curve getting used to it. But since then, my account has kind of blown up. Um, there was like one particular video, which is like my worst video, I would say that went viral. And um, so I got a lot of followers from that. And now, yeah, I have over 200,000 followers, which is wild, but it's turned out to be just a really powerful way to be able to talk really honestly and openly with people about vaccines. And I think like, counterintuitively, TikTok is actually an amazing platform for this because you have the option to make either a 15 or a 60 second video about whatever you're doing. And so it's a very short digestible video and people can actually see what you're doing. You know, what does the lab look like? What does it look like to make a vaccine? Um, as well as answering any questions that people may have. And so I think it's actually, yeah, it's a really, really clever thing. So I've, I've really enjoyed being a part of that. And Anna, if I can add, I mean, what I really love about your TikTok endeavor is that you really humanize science, right? You take it from something that's not static in this textbook that never changes, but reminds people that there's, you know, there's humans behind this and mm -hmm. it's an ever evolving process and you can get involved too, right? So I think that's the other. <laughs> yeah, thing. thanks. That's you saying that too, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you saying that too, that's one of the other things is, is there's this idea that, almost, that scientists are almost a different species. You know what I mean? But like, no, you're a normal human. <laughs> <We're just laughs> well, normal people. I think people realize like right. how weird I am because of TikTok, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's what we need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's really important. I embrace it. So we're almost at time. I'll ask one more philosophical fun question and then Miguel will uh, lead us to the end. So I'll start with Nika. What's one piece of advice you would give your 20 year old self? Um, that's hard. 20 year old self had already made some key decisions that shaped her trajectory, <laughs> but <laughs> a younger Nika, let's just a say. younger Nika, yeah. a younger Nika, I would say make a more informed decision about what you're going to do than I did. I kind of just defaulted to this path. I got lucky, right? And I had the right mentors, the right parents, the right environment to make sure that I reach my potential and I'm able to do the things that make me passionate. But had any of those elements been different, I could have ended up in a very different place. And so I think being more active myself and kind of learning what are the things that I could be doing in my future career, what does that look like? And trying to form at least somewhat of a plan more so than I did would have been good. <laughs> well, you did, you did quite well. You're, you're, I can say that. Uh, Anna. That's a good question. So I guess um, what I would tell my younger self is actually probably advice that I would tell other people as well, which is just kind of this idea that if other people can do it, so can you, right? And so I think that's really where this idea of you know, having role models that come from all different backgrounds and look different, different genders is really good because I think as someone sees like, oh, there's a, you know, woman doing science, it's kind of opens their mind to think like, oh, okay, well, I could do that too, right? Like, there's nothing special about that person that makes them inherently capable of that. And so I think it's, yeah, it's just this, this idea of opening your mind and being able to believe in yourself, no, no matter who you are. Great. That's right. Everybody meets the minimum requirement. That's what it is. Um, 
Okay, last question then uh, for the both of you. Are there any initiatives, projects, endeavors that you are overseeing right now that you are excited about and you want everybody to get excited about as well? And Nico, we'll start with you. Well, I think I've said advice to a scientist a million times now, but I haven't mentioned our website. So Say it again. Say it again. Yeah. yeah. No, it's advice to a scientist.com. And we're really initiative by scientist for scientists. So, you know, anyone who wants to get involved is, is more than welcome to get in touch. And whether it's something like writing an article that synthesizes resources that are out there, like the too long didn't read version of things for us, or who like you know, imagines a whole new arm to our initiative like Imran has done with the Twitter platform. We're, we're a blank slate and we totally just want to bring whatever's helpful to the scientific um, community as, as possible. And Anna, what about you? Yeah, so similar for me, you know, Team Halo is a group of people that are actually all over the world and constantly actually recruiting people to be a part of the team to educate people about COVID-19 um, over TikTok. But I would actually encourage really any scientist to get involved in TikTok. I think it's a really cool opportunity to share what you do and your passion for science with, you know, people who are usually of an impressionable age. And so, yeah, I would love to see more comrades on there. You've inspired me. I got to download it. <laughs> I was going to, I was going to say, what's your, what's your TikTok handle for everybody? Uh, it's at Anna.Blakeney. All right. And we'll be looking for Nika's next. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you some tips. Please do. Send me a high <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if part of our trainings, even grad school, we incorporate how to use social media and whatnot. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a thing to think about. Um, super fun talking to both of you. I'm, I think Miguel Echoes is super excited that both of you are part of the school. And I, I see big, big, big things uh, in both of your careers. And always both Miguel and I and the team are here to support you. And again, thank you so much and uh, all the best. Thanks so much, guys. This was super fun. Thanks for having us. This is great.